everybody's having a good day. I want to uh, again extend a welcome to everyone and glad you're joining us. I want to touch on a few things about just introductory concepts, some guiding concepts, and go through a couple of examples and look at some options. And then again, as we mentioned, have some time to answer some questions and may perhaps further discussion in the very last slide we'll have the uh, professional uh, development continuing de education certificate information for you to to follow there so we'll probably leave that slide up so that you can have that information so getting on to our topic today looking at detention basin design and some of the the ideas realize after putting some material together for the presentation that it's rather encompassing discussion. It's been around a long time. A lot of people are familiar with uh, detention, retention, wet, dry, uh, flood retarding structures, dams, embankments, a lot of topics and issues and engineering matters that circulate around the general topic of what we think of as detention. And it's been used for a lot of reasons, uh, some of which is to decrease the runoff peak as as land use changes perhaps from development or other activities to retain volume even to infiltrate if possible uh, to remove pollutants and that's becoming more and more a topic of discussion uh, mimicking pre-developed hydrology conditions for the full range of flood events in some places, uh, groundwater recharge is, is a factor and considered. Uh, places that uh, have aquifers, they look at aquifer recharge, like the Edwards Aquifer Zone. Um, others use it for erosion control. It's something that the, the EPA has had in Phase 1 and Phase 2 construction regulations for a long time as a way to, to alleviate erosion and, of course, to provide that attenuation. And we think of it as detention, but uh, sinks or depression storage has always been a concept in our hydrology and accounted for. Obviously, the type of detention we're looking at is a little more focused, been around a long time, looking at uh, flood control things, structures relate to, to water resources, maybe things that are provide flood control and recreational use and irrigation uses depending on the part of the country you may be in. Very much a part of the history of uh, the United States. In 1935, Congress established what was then referred to as the Soil Conservation Service, later becoming the National um, a Resource Conservation Service. So flood control, soil conservation structures has been a part of the fabric of this country. And we see it today, and it's oftentimes turned to and, and used by state, county, city, uh, regulating authorities as a means for us to, to accomplish some of the goals that, that we just listed, most notably probably the, the attempt at flood control, but a lot of communities um, have been using them for years for other purposes, water quality, aquatic benefits, a lot of it incorporated in natural park areas, et cetera. Today we look at them for these detention structures to include quality components, a, a sand filter for bay, uh, sediment removal, floatables removable, uh, removal, uh, and multi-use facilities, which we have a couple examples of here and many more. So. Very interesting topic, has been around a while, and the analysis of it is even more fascinating. But, but when we look at some of the, of the drivers, we know there's an increase in runoff when land use changes, whether that be for industrial, residential, commercial, governmental, all the different purposes for land use, and then the, the Knock off of that, of course, being there's some change going to happen in the in the hydrologic functioning of that. The runoff will be affected, which means others downstream and upstream may be affected as well. 
a lot of times today in infill in inner city areas or maybe flooding that is existing. A lot of times detention, maybe above ground, maybe below ground, or a combination of the two is used to alleviate flooding due to undersized systems. And in those same kinds of infill areas where it may be infeasible to, to build uh, pipe systems that require massive amounts of, of, of roadway excavation and disruption or other types of improvements like, like new pipes that are properly sized, maybe just in, entirely too costly and detention becomes the, the main alternative. And sometimes if, if putting in a bigger pipe and doing all of that is, is possible, that might unintentionally move the problem downstream. And certainly that is to be avoided as well. So there's a lot of reasons that we turn to detention and just wanted to, to highlight that as well. And one that we see a lot and uh, we find being used more and more is detention that doesn't, preferably, doesn't look like a large hole in the ground. Uh, detention that has a multi-use. Recreation, open space, a couple examples from uh, Steve Banks and City Fort Worth provided me with some photos of some areas and that they're using that are, are regional, in fact, detention facilities. Uh, this example, of course, is a, a large play, playground area. It uh, uh, doubles as a soccer field and adjacent to a, a city park. Um, another facility that is actually through a cooperative partnership with a local independent school district and one of the, the benefits, the school district got a new playing field. And the city, of course, uh, was able to build in regional detention for it. So and there are cases where that multi-use concept, uh, making things feasible, making it affordable, detention is, is turned to more and more for, for all of those multitude of reasons. So looking at the some of the drivers, some of the, the history that has affected us with detention, and then we've seen a lot through that same time frame that has said we have to design it. We know there's some contributing area coming to it. How do we calculate the flow that gets there? And then there's a whole host of methods that people have used through those through that time. Um, and then we need the size of the detention pond. And it's going to be how big? One acre, five acres, 50 acres? That sizing, what size does it need to be answering that question has been a challenge and to, to be tackled uh, for many years. The outfall conditions, so how much water do we release? How much is, is the downstream system capable of handling? Maybe that's a controlling factor. Maybe it's not. Um, and then the sizing of that outfall. Do we size it for just the 100 year and let all the other storms just blow through, as they say? Or do we have multi-staged outfall with uh, weird or, you know, small orifices, standpipe, with overflow weirs and then emergency overflows, et cetera. And then if we get it all figured out, we think we have, and we put it all together, how do we simulate that? How can we, how can we be sure or have some assurances that we've appropriately sized, designed and sized it, and that it functions as we hope it will in fact function? All of these challenges, and it's interesting that as I put this list together, I began to realize that kind of software has been driven to some degree by these needs to answer these questions to, to help designers, engineers, and hydrologists gain confidence and, and arrive at the design and have confidence in that. So we'll begin by looking at some of these approaches. Uh, and over time, a lot of these approaches are have changed. Uh, what was acceptable 20, 30 years ago may not be acceptable today or tomorrow or next year. But but all of the variety of tools that have been out there in all of the states, if you scour the, the United States and find all kinds of criteria that covers 
uh, such a range of, of aspects of this that we see the need, of course, is still basic to size, design, and somehow simulate these as they put as they come together. So maybe the rational method, maybe somebody has has used 400 acres and now it's down to 200 acres. And some communities have said no, 10 acres is the maximum amount. Um, some have used a rational method as the hydrology source and said, well, it's a triangular hydrograph. We can work with that. Others have said, no, it, it needs to be the full hydrograph. And it can't be the 15 minute or the three hour, six hour. It needs to be 24 hour. And then routing it. How do we work out the, the inflow, outflow, storage over time challenge to, to actually put the water in the pond, get the water out of the pond, and see if it all worked. And then the throttle for all of that, of course, is the outfall itself. What does it regulate to and how much water is released? So going in a little bit on each of these real quickly, we see that the beginning point of the hydrology as it rational method is that some of the variety of methods that are out there today and we pick synthetic events or design storms and we are finding in a lot of places of the country that they're able to, to reanalyze current rainfall, account for uh, potential climate change conditions, and develop standards probably a, a little more relevant to, to our day and time. As I'm doing research for this, notice looking back that some of our methods are 30, 40 plus years old. And maybe not that much has changed, and they're still just fine, but may merit a, a new look at it. So we come up with some rainfall, and we have to to calculate uh, some runoff from that, and then is there some duration? Is it um, short duration or longer durations? Of course, there's volume affected there, and which return events is it most critical? Some have good water quality benefits. Some have good flood control benefits. Some have stream bank protection benefits. And then somebody says, well, you need to check the storm from, you know, five years ago in June. And then you have historical records. And that may, may be an entirely new issue to look at and consider. And looking at, you know, the, the, the approach that we use, the, the runoff that we get from that is, is it just that simple triangular hydrograph? And we... Based in, a, in a crude fashion, route that through a detention pond, or do we look at a full hydrograph where we have time low flow events, and at each time step we have uh, that flow recorded or, or calculated for us? And then, uh, as we mentioned, very very important aspect being the outfall structure. Many of us may be familiar with these. It's it's maybe as simple as a, as a pipe culvert with a head wall. It may be uh, more complicated and need uh, low flow orifices of varying sizes and varying uh, reasons um, to, to create different effects uh, and to manage the flow as we end up with this basically in these multiple uh, configurations um, have the ability to to look at a stage storage dis, uh, discharge uh, curve, so it gives us a relationship for all of those. Um, and so, outfalls have, in my experience, have gone from very simple pipe in the ground to now. I think it's probably more ex standard approach to have very complex. And the more complicated that gets, of course, the more challenging the, the analysis is. So uh, arriving at that, getting the information, how do we route it through? Then we have an outfall, we have some flow coming in, we have a, a hole in the ground, if you will, or a, a basin size. Now routing is the, is the point where we uh, see if it all works. And, and some sense, maybe with steady state, it, it's just an analysis, or I mean an estimate. Other more complex solutions um, are able to, to actually uh, solve and balance 
controlling factors, like there may be a downstream tailwater that affects the outfall. It might be interconnected ponds. And how does uh, the rating curve or, or that complex outfall function through the full hydrograph? And that's what we want to explore today and look at some examples. Because some of these other methods have some limitations, many of the standard approaches are maybe hit or miss. In the past, they may have just looked at the 100-year and the lower flow events just, just go right through. Even looking at a, at a full range, the 1, 2, 5, 10, 25, 50, 100-year event, we may, in fact, also end up with um, some gaps, possibly not fully understanding. Um, the method we are, are going to show using XP today is routing a full hydrograph through. We can fully account for timing of the volume or timing of the hydrograph and the full volume of the hydrograph. And if there's a tailwater condition or if there are interconnected ponds, all of this uh, can easily be simulated and, and best represented in a full dynamic solution. And that's what XP offers. So we're going to look at a look at a few examples in just a moment that that show how we can um, change or uh, have the ability to um, evaluate the variety the, the range the full range of examples that we're talking about so um, it's got a robust calculation step again uh, for or calculation rather for each time step and provide you a, a completer a more complete picture for how the detention pond is functioning so with that we'll switch over to a couple of examples and I will set my screen again if you have questions there is a a question um, section that you can can look at or, or rather submit your questions and that will uh, give you the ability to have others respond to that. So let me get switched over. What you're seeing on your screen is actually the um, Mickey Mouse shaped detention structure that was at the Walt, Walt Disney World Speedway. I'm not sure what the outfall structure for that looked like, but it could be just as comical. So looking at some examples here, I've got uh, several pulled up just for us to evaluate, and then I want to show you a few more things before we're done here today. So say we had a subdivision that's being developed. Part of it was already developed. Part of this model actually is a traditional um, uh, multi-link, so it's a roadway, excuse me, a roadway draining plus um, the underground pipe system, so it's a multi-link. And then we're simulating developing a few of these areas that uh, were previously undeveloped and are going to be developed. And so what we want to capture is several things. Um, there's a pond here, there's an outfall device. So what is the impact of this development in somewhat of an infill situation? And that can be a tricky situation to, to analyze. So I'm going to turn off the CAD image behind the screen so you kind of get a sense for just the, just the links and nodes that are shown here. And we've labeled these to, to help out a bit. So I've created some scenarios. And so you can see we've got just a base scenario condition, uh, a developed condition. So you get the difference between the base the way it is today existing and then the way it will be developed and then the mitigated is uh, with the detention pond. And so just looking at, at some of this, click over to hydrology and we see that in the base condition we've got um, Im impervious etc. parameters put in and if we change that to the developed condition we have um, 
much more impervious, same area, much more impervious and it's changed. So the, mimicking the, the change in the, the basin and how, of course, that will impact runoff as well. So uh, similarly, we've, we've mitigated it, so we've changed the size of the pond or added the pond and allowed us to, to simulate then and compare. Have we actually, between the base scenario and developed, provided enough attention to mitigate that? And so because I've already run this, so I wouldn't um, potentially bore you while it ran. Uh, you can see here, looking at the outflow hydrograph here, we've got all three scenarios um, turned on. So we've got our base scenario, which was existing conditions. We have our de with developed condition scenario. And then our mitigated. Um, so you see the blue is base conditions, just under 35 CFS. Um, with the developed, there was an increase. It showed a little peak, pushed it up to over just at 35. But we see with the mitigated condition, we perhaps changed the orifice or the outfall of that pond and are still mitigating that increase in runoff from developed conditions. So that being said, the um, interesting thing to note as well is, is being able to do that on an ongoing basis. So as development occurs in an area that's developing in, in increments or phases, then each phase could be set up in our model. So we could continue to add scenarios, um, parents or child scenarios here, and each of those potentially with different hydrology effects that take place within that developed area. And then the pond can be reevaluated and reconsidered. So this pond here, this node is shown as a as a pond, and we have uh, the storage relationship put in. So for two acres or, or two feet of depth, rather, we have this much surface area. And so you can see that's the description, the numerical description of the pond to the model. And then the outfall device is set up as well. And that is set up as an orifice. And so we have a side orifice here with a certain orifice area. And we have another orifice at a different elevation with a different area. So through the multi-link, we're able to characterize or describe that very complex outfall structure. And it could have, obviously, a weir at the top, as this one has, and that may be the, the, uh, the safety spillway, the overflow spillway, with a length um, here and a crown and a crest. So uh, you can, with one multi-link, completely describe that complex outfall structure. And so when the simulation occurs, you know you're seeing that full hydrograph that's coming to the pond location being routed through that complex structure and then to the outfall using, of course, these scenarios. And all three scenarios are solved with that. And that allows you to do the comparison at the outfall that we just looked at. Okay, let's switch to a, a different example. This example is showing um, we, we have a, a couple of scenarios in this example, um, but what this is, is focusing on is not so much the, the scenarios that we're looking at, is that comparison and that, that contrast that we see between um, base flow, or, or in this case our existing conditions, our base scenario, with a peak about 30 CFS, and then a proposed development uh, here with with, uh, with a lot of impervious area and increased time of concentration is going to change that hydrology, and we see how, how much uh, peak there is there. So that has a, a tremendous effect on that. In this, in this case, that quick analysis, that quick just how um, how is this impacting? Uh, 
what I want to illustrate with this is just how, how quick and easy it is to set this up. So I, I simply went in and drew my catchment using the Polygon tool here in XP. I could have imported that from GIS um, or from CAD. And seeing that, then I was able to, or, or having uh, that, I was able in runoff to using the tools, calculate node catchment area, to calculate the node area. So I drew that polygon, I let the machine do the calculation for me. I knew how much um, area there was, so that populated my runoff here. So within my SCS hydrology, um, and then the SCS uh, rainfall, and I was able to run it. And then in the uh, do that for the the, the base scenario, and then is add to that the developed, and I was able to quickly, just within a few minutes, run that and, get, and see how much increase in flow am I looking at. So, so my required, uh, restricted rather, outflow would be, looks, you know, 28.5 or so, uh, 29 CFS. That would be our allowable discharge from the detention pond due to the changes in the watershed. So that was uh, very handy, very easy. Again, going to answering some of these questions uh, relating to the detention pond and the, the analysis, how much runoff is coming to me, how fast is it getting there, how much volume am I talking about, and then what am I restricted to on my outflow? because the restriction of the outflow, or what we are allowed to discharge from the site, of course, drives largely uh, what that outfall structure will look like. So moving on to another example, and this is a little bit different way to use it, but kind of using it, the software more as a, as a tool as well, and, and something you can get in quickly and do an analysis of, and and get some answers. So this is just a little example site. Uh, they want to, we're going to make some changes here in this area, and they were able. Their outfall was restricted, so they had to do some some detention. And in this case, an industrial facility had to had to have some sediment treatment as well. But their initial question was, how much are we talking about discharging here? So this I want to illustrate because what we've done is set up very simple, um, just calculating runoff. In this case, I have an existing, and I'm not using the scenarios here, so I just set up and said, here's existing runoff, and I have some, some value for that, so I know existing runoff. Um, here's developed, um, and can I can I then mitigate that somehow? So we've set up the hydrology to then uh, act as a, a detention pond, and then there's an outfall pipe going to, uh, in this case, we just did a free fall outfall. So what I want to illustrate with this example is using our basin design optimization. So the hydraulics mode, we've got our node here, and we're calling it a storage node. And then we've got, from the outfall of that, we have a circular pipe. We just put in, I just put in a, a nominal 12-inch pipe. It's a very small site, so we're going to see how we can restrict the flow. But I don't know much more than that. So I've got several unknowns, and I, and I want to illustrate using uh, a, a tool that we have called Basin Optimization. So if you go into the storage node properties, you see there's a couple of things we can check here. At the very top is Basin Optimization. And the Basin Optimization allows you to put in certain known parameters 
and then have others calculated. So for example, if we wanted the software to iter iterate from, I know the maximum water surface I can get in the pond, what size should my downstream pipe be? And we can click on resize the downstream pipe. Uh, in this case, I could resize the basin. So I know my downstream outfall pipe size. I know the maximum exceedance level. I know the top of the pipe, but I want to resize the basin, so recalculate the, the volume required in the basin. How about if I want to resize the downfall downstream pipe and the basin? And then here I can put in the maximum allowable discharge and the again the, the maximum exceedance level. Or if I just I just want to I don't don't care how deep or, or or high the water gets, I can I can deal with that, but I've got to lower you know this maximum allowable discharge value is the driver for me. Then I can I can optimize the basin size. So I don't have to go in and put in the basin size in that case. I'm just going to optimize it to that specific size. So this allows um, some design uh, you know, choices and gives you a design tool essentially that can help in the beginning, the early phases of, of what we were just discussing about some of the unknowns. Um, how much discharge is coming to me? How, how can I deal with the um, constraints in the outflow, etc.? And maybe you don't know all the answers to that going in. Or maybe it's very early conceptually in the project. And this is not going to be your final model, but you kind of need some answers early on. And this, uh, this basin optimization gives you that capability to run different op optimization types and get an idea of the range of how am I going to deal with the differences in runoff between the existing and the developed conditions. And so I can set up this third option and you can see how simple this is. Just a couple of nodes in runoff mode and then switch over to hydraulics and um, run that. So I'm actually going to run this here. So we're going to go to uh, storage node. We're going to look at optimization and we're going to say resize the downstream pipe. And then we're going to go to the downstream pipe here. And it's just uh, for simple, simple exercise here. It's 40 foot long, one foot diameter pipe. Okay, got all our elevations in there. So if we actually run this, and of course this is a simple example so it only takes a second to run but just to illustrate this then we go in and we remember we did our optimization but we did it based on the downstream pipe so I'm okay with my um, my downstream system can handle whatever but I can't have this maximum elevation be any greater than 11 say so if I go in and, and, and look at my downstream pipe now, what did it do? I had it one foot, which was obviously undersized, so it, it helps me to adjust that pipe size to two feet. So it just gives you an idea of the difference in, in a quick way to do some analysis that will help in the beginning, middle, and end of the project, and if we look back at at some of the some of the different challenges in detention pond design that we talked about, those all can can be very critical as we go through the project. And having a tool like XP that can do that is extremely valuable. So there's a lot, as I mentioned, talking about the aspects of um, the tension pond design. There's a lot of, of 
extra issues or, or peripheral matters that go into this. Uh, we talked about and stressed here the, the full hydrograph aspect. Um, XP can also look at pollutants. You could run pollutants and, and see removal and, and water quality benefits from those. Maybe we want to do um, multiple storm events and look at uh, uh, using global storms. We could also determine the residence time because we have the full hydrograph, we're routing that through, maybe it's a series of interconnected ponds, we can demonstrate the residence time in each pond or the time to drain and make sure that it drains before the next uh, storm event occurs. Uh, the optimization we touched on, um, XP can do a longer term uh, simulation events like a year's worth of, of simulation data, uh, some of the Florida examples of their interconnected ponds that are modeled in XP um, are that way. We could, and this is kind of a new area, a new frontier, but many of you are aware of two-dimensional hydraulic modeling and the, the capabilities in XP that accounts for overland flow and we could, could use uh, those depressions or those same um, uh, detention pond areas and route the two-dimensional flow uh, through there and get an idea of how that's functioning. And that has been done um, by some case examples of that are some wetlands in Minneapolis uh, or, or, or Minnesota area and, and some other areas where they've used XP in complex uh, wetlands and used the actual two-dimensional flow to route that through wetlands areas see not only the attenuation uh, but velocities as well. And then on top of that we could do rainfall on the grid and flow to the detention. So um, sort of the coup de grace, the, the pinnacle of all of it is having all of this linked together our 1D pipe network system, two-dimensional overland flow, accounting for the full timing of the hydrograph, time and volume, and we can see that detention of effect in analysis and in design. And that last one is actually where I think most uh, analysis in highly urbanized areas where there's complex drainage structures and features, there's people's lives and homes affected. The most robust analysis we can possibly give it is this low, the, the bottom point here of that 1D, 2D uh, design analysis. And that's that is the the probably most focused on right now, and where XP is is very well suited for that analysis. And if you have any questions, of course, we can be reached at ansales at xpsolutions.com. I'd like to personally thank everyone for attending today, and hope that you'll join us. We have webinars uh, regularly. Check back regularly with the XP Solutions website. And if you haven't been to the XP Solutions website lately, I would encourage you to visit. Um, I want to, to draw your attention to, on the website, a couple of things. Under Support, you can go to Product Resources. Product Resources brings up a very nice uh, area that you can get all of the self-guided tutorials, the Getting Started manuals, and download some resources. There's samples and example models and templates, and you can get to help documentation and how to how how do I videos. And on the, for example. On the basin optimization, so you can see how nice this web page is. On the basin optimization, you can actually see um, a full description of the different options in basin optimization. So you get to to peruse the the help and find out the the detailed questions that you might have as you use it. So I wanted to to draw your attention to that as we close. So thank you for attending. And thank you.